I'm Sarah Wilson, and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. This week, I'm speaking to Chris Williams, who's the co-founder of Edible Culture, which is a nursery based in Faversham. Um, Edible Culture hard to put them into words really what they do um suffice to say that it's it's amazing it's incredible what they're doing down on their nursery um they are growing plants raising plants from seed and from cuttings they're saving seed they're growing peat free they're growing organic they're growing without chemicals and they have uh, an aversion to single use plastics which is um being expressed in the way that they sell their products um everything they're doing in their business um is sound and it, it's ethically wonderful. I can't speak highly enough about what they're doing. Um, if you want to check out their website, I will put the the address in the show notes um, and also an address where you can find um, the pots that they're using, the paper pots that Chris speaks about in the interview, which is um, posipot.co.uk. Um, but I do urge you to go and check out the website because it's inspiring. And um, the last question that I asked Chris was actually about business and, and whether it's possible to run a profitable business ethical business and it's really interesting what he says um so yeah do I, I hope you enjoy the interview i immensely enjoyed speaking to chris um and if you get the chance to go down to faversham i urge you to go and check out the nursery so the first thing i wanted to ask you is i know you've kind of you've been on a lot of programs haven't you and you were saying you've been yeah. on radio and everything um and i think a lot of gardeners um know about you but in case they don't could you just explain a little bit about the business and the values behind it yeah sure um yeah so it's edible culture as the name suggests really we specialize in uh, edibles but particularly um interesting unusual things like herbs vegetable plants fruit trees um, but the main the main thing or the things that are I suppose our values is that we we um, want to make sure that we sell seasonal plants so we sell them when they are ready to be planted give people the advice that they need to put things in at that time of the year and also uh, in the right places um, and also make sure that what we're producing has has a positive impact on the environment rather than a negative impact which, which sounds odd when you're producing plants because you'd assume plant producing is, is positive anyway, but in the sense of how we apply, how we grow those plants to benefit the, the environment long term and also while they're at the business as well. So um, the, ma- the main main areas of that is that we, we don't use peat, so we use peat-free compost. We don't use chemicals. And we also um, have cut out the all single-use plastic that goes to our customers. So essentially creating a product or business that's, that's, that's really um, pumping up kind of positive uh, impacts on the environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the I think a lot you've had a lot of coverage on your um, no single-use plastic um, issue. So yeah. I think that your aim this year has been to ensure that no single-use plastic will leave the site. But how do you achieve that? Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's quite um, it, it's an interesting one because with horticulture, it's quite a heavy user of plastic, the industry. Um, but what we we thought we, we broke it down into into certain uh, main areas that we where plastic would be used. So one of them being plants, of course. Uh, the other being compost. The other being plant feed and sundry items. And we just looked at solutions of how we could sell them, and also in, kind of take inspiration from how it used to be sold before. Plastic was heavily used, so um, um, and we took the narrative that we basically within the business it's illegal for us to sell this anything with single-use plastic. So we had this really hard line um, narrative to say, right, we've, this we've got to do it, and we, we're not we're not going to um, stray away from it and kind of get tempted to go back to our usual way. So, um, but the main ways we've done that is with compost, for example, we we buy the compost in bulk form rather than in bags, and we actually decant that compost into uh, reusable bags for life that we had crew had made um, that the customer uh, buys with the first bag of compost and then they bring that bag back every time to get refilled so they haven't got that single use bag to throw away at the end mm-hmm. um, it's worked really well um, that, that, that's a really positive way forward with the compost um, with, with plant feeds particularly like bone meal that sort of thing, and also even liquid 
plant feed is we buy that again in bulk form. So we're buying it in big bags, big tubs, and we decant it into into bags and bottles and weigh them in, in the process. So people only have to buy what they need. So they have to buy masses of it in lots and lots of plastic bags. Mm. Um, and that's kind of gone down really well because that's, that's given people a nice choice, but also allowing people to buy what they need at the time. And, and, and thirdly, the big, other big one was, was plants. Um, and we grow plants in sort of a few different primary sizes of, of pot. Um, and so we, we actually decided and realized through lots of research that actually plastic is a very good tool to grow plants in, in the nursery. It just shouldn't be seen as something that is disposable. It should be seen as something that is a valued long-term investment that you have in the nursery and use, but you don't pass that problem on to the customer. So we decided to create um, takeaway paper pots that we actually put the plants into at a point of sale that then the customer takes home. So they've got no plastic at all associated with that uh, plant. They can plant the whole thing in the ground, meaning they've got nothing at all, no waste at all. Um, and then we put the plastic put back into the nursery to be reused. Um, essentially taking responsibility for that, mm-hmm. that um, material and, and we do sort of de- declassifying it in our minds and saying, well, okay, plastic's very useful, but we've abused it, uh, not just us personally, but you know, us as human race mm-hmm. uh, abuse it. Um, if we then reclassify and say, okay, well, we're going to use X amount of plastic pots per year, but we're not going to buy any more, we're not going to send any out into the general public, and we've actually stopped the, the, what the, the chain of waste going through to the end user. So it was, it was a, a long process getting back to that because we just assumed that we'd find some product that would get us away from plastic completely. But it just, it just doesn't exist. So mm. we had to be creative and think of a solution that would work for us. Yeah. Um, so if people had pots at home, do you take those to recycle them as well? Uh, that's the plan, yeah. So the way we work here, we're, we're quite fortunate. So we're based at a secondary school. We rent our space off of the secondary school. Um, and within the school, they've... they've um, they're trialling various environmental incentives uh, for students to get involved with, one of them being a, a plastic recycling process. So they've actually uh, got some funding to buy a machine that shreds up plastic into a form that can then be processed into something new. So we actually, those pots that do break in, our, in the, the nursery, the ones we have to dispose of, we put them through this machine that, for us to then be able to make pots again. Mm-hmm. So we then replace any of those broken pots with what's already broken. And the idea being that eventually people will be able to come and bring their pots in to us and we'll be able to put them through that process and actually um, benefit the school, benefit the students. We can use it to make other products, possibly go into the industry somehow. Um, essentially trying to, with the hope that over time, that the amount of plastic that goes around that cycle will be fewer and fewer until such time as other materials out there but the idea being that it's a circular system and we don't let it leave the site and, mm. um, uh, you know because for, for most people well, particularly at home there's no real option apart from putting it into the general waste which probably gets incinerated yeah. which isn't so sustainable no no quite um the only thought i had is if somebody took uh, had a plant from you um and then i mean I'm notorious for buying plants and then leaving them languishing on my driveway until I get around to putting them in for like a sure. month or so. Um, how long would they last outside a pot or is there, are there things that people can do once they get home to counter um, that? There's a few things they could do. I mean, the, the, the paper pot um, in the open, if it's kind of, particularly if it's, if it's kept wet, then it will probably, it will stay intact, intact for a couple of weeks. It will right. start to break down in terms of the bottom of the pot will, but like if you picked it up, it would probably start falling apart. Mm. So it will kind of hold it in place. I mean, what some people do is they take them home and actually pop them up, uh, you know, particularly if they've got pots at home yeah. they've had left over. They may just pop them up temporarily. And then, um, so then, although they're using a plastic pot again, but they're recycling, they're not, they're not adding to their pile of pots. Yeah. Um, a lot of our customers say they do plant them fairly quickly, maybe in a couple of days a week. And then by that point, by the time they've put them in, that pot's, Degrading, so that means that the roots will get into the soil quite quickly. So it's it's really sort of designed 
designed to be a fairly temporary measure. And we almost hope that it kind of may encourage people to plant them quickly as well, yeah. which is kind of beneficial to sure plant. Does, but, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are going to be instances where people will forget and they might dry out. But the main thing is you, you treat it very much like any plant in the pot you buy in the garden centre and water it the same, but it just will break down a bit obviously quicker. Yeah. Um, but that's good because when it goes into the ground, it breaks down quick as well. So yeah. that's the important thing. Definitely. Um, and the other thing I meant, I noticed on your website was that you do talk about pesticides and herbicides. Um, what is there? What do you use, if anything? What, what What's kind of acceptable on the nursery? Well, we 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 don't use actually we don't use anything. We well we use a foliar feed, mm. um, which which we find that if the plant's quite stressed through aphid damage, for example, we can give it a boost with feeding. So it's important to keep plants healthy. Uh, in an environment that, that they like. So, for example, we've got two big glass houses and two polytunnels. So we will move plants out quite quickly in the spring as soon as the weather allows to make sure that the plants are not in an environment that will breed more pests and disease. Um, obviously, those that want to be in the greenhouse will stay in the greenhouse. Um, but what we've also developed is we've created a, a site that all around the nursery is uh, uh, developed for wildlife. So we've left... Um, grass to grow longer to create meadow spaces we've, we've created uh, we've got, we're lucky we've got a pond here as well um, but uh, and also we've got we plant up areas around so we're creating a habitat for predatorial insects like ladybirds birds um, lace wings hoverflies bees etc all these beneficial uh, insects wildlife that will help keep these problems under control and Generally, the aphids, we will get some plants that are very susceptible and we just accept that and we, we try and educate and show people that that's what happens and naturally will kind of um, sort itself out over the season. Mm. Um, and diseases, yeah, we will get some, but we, we, what we found is because we've built up this ecosystem on site, we, we, we actually can grow things basically organically without any major problems. It's, it's quite interesting seeing the process and we, we, we've been really pleased with how that. So, yeah. so the answer really the quick answer for, was really we don't do anything you know in terms of what we put on the plants we, yeah. just, we just create an environment that's, that's best for the plant that's um that's fascinating and inspiring um because a lot of nurseries that i've spoken to will tell me that you can't grow professionally especially edibles um without using um a level of pesticides so that is that's lovely to hear and, and yeah. you know, and inspiring, as I say, if people do want to make that step. But obviously good husbandry is key and as is building up a kind of natural resistance through the way that you grow plants. Yeah, so. I, I think it's, it's the way we started. I mean, we started on that ethos straight away and I think that made it easier because we we, we found ways of doing things straight away. Mm. Um, I, I suppose our scale is relatively small. Uh, I mean, we may grow... 10, 20,000 plants in, in the scheme of some businesses that may grow hundreds of thousands or even millions or that, you know, really big companies. In that sense, it's probably a bit more challenging because you've got so many more things to look after. But I think with edibles particularly, um, we, we just don't feel comfortable with knowing that a herb that someone may buy and use pretty quickly um, it has got some sort of chemical on it because otherwise... It, it, it's creating a plant that's not particularly healthy for the environment, but also for people's health. Um, and also, we try and encourage people to to smell them, smell mm. the plant, uh, taste them, even if they want to. Cause, you know, it's completely um, nat- natural. So, and I think that's really important. I think more people want want that to happen and want to see that as well. Yeah. Well, I think also the way you raise your plants, um, I, I'm kind of of the mind that once you, if you were a nursery or a, a plant shop that was buying in things from from somewhere where they had been grown as a monoculture and had been grown en masse, I think what happens is that they get kind of pelted with various chemicals to keep everything in check. And once they reach the new site, I find that there seems to be a bit of an explosion of either a pest or disease. And that's because of the way that they've been intensively grown, whereas your stuff is raised, if if I'm right, is raised from cuttings and from seed. And so it's yeah. kind of got, again, that built-in resilience because of how you've you've raised that plant. So... 
the whole thing just feeds into work as a as a whole, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And and the seasonality of that is really important. So rather than forcing a plant in a in a glass house, for example, obviously we grow stuff initially in, in, under glass or under the, under the cover to get it growing, but and to keep it off the frost away from frost. But in, in terms of uh, forcing plants from then onwards to be flowering earlier, because that's when people, people want to see it looking like that, or or even um, importing them so they're kind of ready to go straight away. We, we think, well, you know, we say to people, okay, well, if you want to buy such and such, it's ready at that time of the year. If you want to buy this, this that time of year. So getting people used to the fact that every, every month there's something they can buy from us that is seasonally ready. And by that point, the plant is stockier, um, healthier. They plant it out and it can go straight out because it's been acclimatised. It's, it's right for the environment that it's in. Um, and the plant tends to be better long term then. And as, as you said, it, in terms of pests and disease, it tends to be a lot more, a lot tougher mm. than it might have been if, it was, if it's been um, grown indoors and then put straight outside, or it's been moved around and things like that. So yeah, yeah it's about trying to trying to trying to sort of similar what what businesses are trying to do with food. You know, trying to get people to understand the, the different times of the year and when you buy things. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so from the business perspective, um, lots of people, I, th- I think, historically have set up businesses with quite good intentions. And then maybe the first time they struggle with paying, meeting the rent or, you know, it, it, sometimes it's hard to keep your values when you've got financial, you know, constraints or, or demands on you. So it, do you yeah. think it's fair to say it is possible to run an ethical business and make a profit? I, yeah, I, I do. I do. I, I think you've. Um, I, I think there is. There's a particular. It depends how you run the business. I think because um, we've had a very particular attitude towards business. That in the sense that obviously we we we, we need to cover our costs of running the business. We want to make a profit. We want to be able to pay ourselves. We've got members of staff and all the other things that's usual for businesses. But we've always we've always kind of thought more outside the box and thought more than just pure finance about, uh, you know, um, how, how many expense we can save on this and this and this and whether actually doing the right thing and actually really, really being strong about the values to customers. And what, what we find is that we're, customers respect that and they, they want to support us for that. And also they're, because it's a, because it's um, a slightly unusual, different way of doing it, people then tell other people and say, these guys are doing this, it's really different, really good. You know they're really passionate about what they do, um, and we probably have a section of of the market in the sense there will be customers that won't come to us because they want more traditional garden centre or mm-hmm. looking for weed killers or whatever they might be looking for. But I think that's fine because I think there is there is enough people out there to run a business. I mean, we we're, when we're growing slowly, we haven't pushed ourselves to grow kind of ridiculously fast and I think that would that would be challenging we'd have times then I think where it would be financially difficult because sometimes you know particularly as I said with the seasonality of what we're trying to trying to do it just wouldn't work being too quick so we just let the business develop really slowly and, and make sure that it's the right thing to do so it is possible I think you just got a really good sort of attitude towards it rather than um, purely about raking in as much money as you want as you can <laughs> rather than and, and, and trying to balance that. Yeah. Well, I think that's really heartening to hear. I think a lot of people will be pleased to know that it, you know, it is possible to yeah. have a profitable business and not to sell your soul. <laughs> no, exactly. You know, I, I, I do, I do generally think that is, that is the case. Yeah. Brilliant. So a huge thank you to Chris for his time. Um, I hope you enjoyed that interview. I did it. I really enjoyed speaking to Chris and, um, And I'd kind of like to throw down the gauntlet, I suppose, to other nurseries who might be listening, um, just to say that it is possible. It is possible to ditch the chemicals. It's possible to ditch the plastics. It's possible to stop buying in plants from overseas and to grow your own. And yes, I realise that if you're a big nursery, it's going to take a lot of time to adapt and to change. But it is possible. Um, you know, you just we need to start getting this nursery infrastructure here in the UK. We need to start having independent nurseries, smaller ones, more dotted about, 
um, you know, and I hope if you're thinking of, of going into business in horticulture or in, in any sort of business, um, it, I just think it's very encouraging to hear that it's possible to, you know, keep yourself earning money, making a profit without throwing away your values. Um, so I really enjoyed this episode. I hope you did too. And I'll catch you next Tuesday. <laughs>